Hello and welcome to another episode of Android Faithful, your weekly source of the latest news, hardware, and apps for the world, the wide, wide world of Android. Hello, everybody. I am Jason Howell. And I'm Ron Richards. I'm Wendu it now. And I'm Michelle Ramon. Oh, yeah. Worked flawlessly. Good to see y'all. Like Missed you last week. The show, too. The How's show your vacation? has just started and I'm already exhausted. <laughs> Confirm. Wow. It's been that kind of week. <laughs> this has been, this is possibly, I think, the biggest week we've had in months in the Android Faithful Land, do you think? Yeah, there's a lot of stuff. I mean, Mobile World Congress just does that, right? Like, there, does there it, are. Does it, though? Does, I feel like previous years were like, oh, Mobile World Congress was a dud. Oh. Well, right? I mean, the last handful of years have been a little weird. Right. I, this was like, this was the big boom of Mobile World Congress that I feel like we haven't felt in a while. Um, and it's making the show going to, this is going to be an extra long edition of Android Faithful. So mm -hmm. buckle up, buckle in Possibly everybody. So. Yeah. While y'all were bantering about 90s shows, I was conserving my energy because I have a, I have this <laughs> big script ready for the <laughs> OnePlus Watch 2 that we'll talk about it's later good. today. Lots of yeah. stuff. All right. Well, before we get into it, because we got a lot of great stuff for th this week, right? Like we're so stuff. I just want to remind everybody, if you are not following us out on the social media, you need to do that. Get on with it. So we are on Twix, uh, Twitter or X, as Twix as we like to call it here. Uh, we are slash Android Faithful on, on Twitter. Uh, we're on Facebook as, at Android Faithful. We are on Instagram at Android Faithful Podcast. Look at we that. We are on Threads at Android Faithful Podcast. Look at that. We're also on Mastodon. We're at Android Faithful at Android Dev Social. And... Uh, our, our least amount of followers, which I really want to grow, uh, we're on Blue Sky also at androidfaithful.bsky.social. So, uh, so many places to follow us. I just want to remind everybody to do that. If you're on Blue Sky, go follow us. If you're on Mastodon, go follow us, et cetera, et cetera. We're going to try to post to all of them all the time and do more. So, uh, we definitely want to grow those channels. So, if you haven't started following, please do. Um, Instagram has got some cool droid guys there. So, yeah. I had such a hard time with Instagram. Try as I might, it's, it's they're all tough. They're all tough. It's really hard for me to to know what to put on Instagram, even though it's probably easier for for everyone else. It seems like, but for me, so Jason, hard. what do we got? What's what, what's going on with this episode this week? What, what, oh, this what, episode, we're not talking about social media. No. Um, okay, <laughs> maybe maybe somewhere in here there is, but I don't think so. No, this week, I mean, you know, it's all it really seems to be entirely about Mobile World Congress. Maybe there's a few stories in here that are tangentially related, or if if at all related, but. Really, this is the year of, or this is the the week of Barcelona. This is the week of oh, come Hamon. On. Come on, oh. yeah, that we aren't eating because we aren't there at in Barcelona. I think we should make a plan next year to all go, and we'll have oh, a boy. Android Faithful annual work meeting in Barcelona at Mobile World Congress okay. around a plate of Hamon. And it'll be a, it'll be an expense. It'll be a write off. Let's do it. Let's, Let's commit to it. Or, right. or, oh, I like that. Or we just put it out in the ether and we say, "Hey, someone wants to sponsor Android Faithful going to Barcelona? We'll do the show." <laughs> anyone Live. listening? Anyone listening who is either related tangentially to a brand that is an affinity <laughs> to our audience, or if yeah. you're an eccentric billionaire, we can be bought. <laughs> we'll hang out with you. Come on, do it. <laughs> Email us at contact.androidfaithful.com. Well, we have um, maybe we need a special uh, Hamon uh, Hamon patron level. Yeah. Where... Oh my goodness, that's amazing idea. I love it. Who wants to uh, sponsor the Hamon? Yeah. <laughs> yes, I think that if you like that idea, go to Patreon, Patreon.com/slash/androidfaithful, and uh, first sign up. And support us and then let us know in the comments somewhere on that site. Oh man. Okay. Why? We've got all of our anyway. interesting plugs out of the oh, way. Mobile World Congress week begins now. Uh, why don't we start with the news, Ron? All right, let's do it. Well, the f well, right out of the gate at Mobile World Congress, Google showed up with a whole bunch of Android well, related announcements um that we're very excited uh to find out about um so uh google announced they, they announced nine new android features to help you stay productive um so a bunch of productivity based updates um so i'm going to run through these you've probably seen them already but you know we can discuss as needed um ai summarized text and group chats will be will be uh arrive will be arriving while driving via android auto um, the Lookout app meant for blind and low vision users will auto describe photos and images, which is very cool. Um, they're rolling out screen reader support for lens and maps. So Talkback will let you know information about maps, about places that map sees. Um, handwritten annotations are coming to docs, which is pretty cool. 
Um, an output switcher support for Spotify, um, uh, which is already supported by YouTube Music. What that actually means is that the little media panel in your notifications pane can be linked to Spotify, which would be very cool. I use YouTube Music. I take advantage of this all the time. Um, updated Fitbit app with Health Connect for integrated data across more wearables and apps. Um, also on the Wear OS side of things, uh, Google Wallet passes are now available on Wear OS devices. So if you've got passes in your Google Wallet, you can pull them up in your uh, Wear OS device on your watch. Um, transit directions within Google Maps available on Wear OS. Um, and then finally, of course, it wouldn't be uh, an announcement from Google if we didn't talk about Gemini. Uh, right now, you can chat with Gemini directly in the Google Messages app. Um, as they're integrating Gemini across the board. I don't know about you guys, have you gotten a message, an upsell message in all of your Gmail accounts to pay, start paying for Gemini like I have? Like I opened up my email today and it was like, try Gemini, try Gemini, try Gemini. I'm like, I know Google, I know about Gemini, I know. Jiminy. I, um, I did get access to Gemini 1.5 actually just the other day. Oh, you and did? I haven't really had time to play around with it yet, cool. but uh, that's gonna be something I'm gonna definitely tr be trying out. So Google Google appeared pretty strong at the start of World uh, Mobile World Congress um, with all the stuff at Android, um, and it was neat to see some Wear OS stuff there because Wear mm -hmm. OS has become a hot button topic for, uh, for the Mobile World Congress, hasn't it? Yeah, and um, so this is interesting. So Google's got Wear OS news that really goes in tandem, um, at least the way the announcement was formulated, um, with OnePlus. And we're going to talk about OnePlus and the hardware that they've announced at Mobile World Congress in a little bit. And I think it's going to come up a little bit now. But um, Michelle and I had the opportunity to speak with uh, Bjorn Kilburn from the Wear OS team. Um, yesterday, uh, kind of timed with some of the news that they were releasing about some changes to Wear OS 4, about some really interesting ways in which wearable devices are going to, at least at least this is the case with the OnePlus Watch 2, and I'm guessing we'll see it more in some other hardware going forward in the future, but um, ways in which they're kind of operating in a sort of hybrid mode which will hopefully ultimately mean better battery life. And so Michelle and I spoke with Bjorn and we've got that video. So we're just going to go ahead and play it in its entirety. And then we'll come back and talk a little bit about it. And of course, we'll talk about the OnePlus Watch 2 after that. So stand by everybody. Here we go. All right. Once again, we are blessed with an opportunity to speak with someone behind the scenes working on the hardware and the software that we all love in the world of Android. Joining uh, Michelle and I is Bjorn Kilburn, who is the VP of Wear OS at Google. Bjorn, it's it's great to meet you and great to talk to you today. It's really great to meet both of you as well. I, I'm really excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I can speak for myself, Michelle, I know you've got the hardware as well. I was literally just before we kind of walked into the studio here <laughs> doing setup on the OnePlus Watch 2 that's on my wrist. Yeah. So I haven't dove into, you know, the, the nuts and bolts of everything that we're going to talk about today, but this is going to be a really good kind of uh, laying the groundwork around what my experience is probably going to be. But why don't we start with Kind of Wear OS for the state of of where we are at with wearables on Android. Just break down, if if you don't mind, as kind of a good starting point, some of the highlights of the new Wear OS four that your team's been working on. Yeah, sure. So you know we're we're focused on streamlining the core smartwatch experience, and in Wear OS four, we added some key, frankly, missing features like watch transfer, meaning. Uh, taking your watch and and getting a new phone and being able to transfer that watch to the new phone adding some apps, flash screens, and, and also bringing Google Calendar, which is, is one of the uh, Google apps that, that we really felt was needed and needed to be added into the Wear OS ecosystem. And then also, you know, one of the biggest things we've still got to solve, um, and I think the, the OnePlus Watch 2 announcement is a great step in that direction, is better battery life. It's, it's one of the key user needs that we still need um, to make progress on in order for the watch to be a tr the trusted device that it really needs to be, and and so a number of the things that we were we, we've done in in uh, Wear OS four to, you know, set the conditions for that are, for example, uh, bringing the the declarative or watch face format, which is a declarative format, and uh, that sets us up to be able to uh, enable watch faces to be much more power efficient. 
Uh, we've also introduced system managed data bindings for tiles for certain uh, data types like, like heart rate or steps. Um, and that allows tiles to be updated without necessarily having to wake up the app in order to update those data types. And we've generally made improvements to power management within Wear OS itself um, in order to make continuous step towards better battery life for users. Yeah, I mean, no question battery life is, I think, at the top, at least in my experience with, with smartwatches. And I haven't had a, a huge amount of experience with watches that are, you know, more devoted to a single thing versus the like wide, you know, the wild, wild west of smartwatches that can do everything, which is amazing as a user. It's like, I want my devices to do everything. But as you say, like, as that feature set expands, then, you know, the battery life as one key example, yeah. really it begins to take a hit. And I think it's hard to measure up. I have to imagine you can tell me <laughs> kind of your perspective on this, but it's hard to measure up uh, against what the expectation of the user is, which is I want a smartwatch that can do all these things and last forever versus what's actually possible. And I know that the architecture yeah. here is a really big part of that story, this hybrid interface uh architecture and i'm just kind of curious like uh, what what exactly is different about the hybrid interface approach uh when you compare it to kind of previous wear os generations and wear os efforts oh sure i mean that's a that's an excellent question we've we've actually been working on uh the hybrid interface in past versions of wear os but we haven't really talked much about it because it's something that we provide to the oems to to um uh, to implement based on their particular uh, power management strategy. But for example, in Wear 3, we added the health hybrid interface, which um, enables Wear Health services to um, be periodically updated by the MCU on the system. Also in Wear 3, um, we have a display uh, hybrid interface, which some OEMs have been using. And then in Wear 4, um, specifically working with, with, um, with OnePlus, we added the notification a hybrid interface, which enabled them to be able to um, handle a lot of the notification use cases on the watch in the MCU whilst leaving the, the AP um, asleep. So having um, we've been building that interface to enable OEMs and and um, and really uh, new new in the OnePlus Watch 2 is the addition of viewing and dismissing bridge notifications on the MCU and then seamlessly transitioning to the AP if a more you know more bespoke reply, for example, if the keyboard user wants to type out uh, a response, then we seamlessly transition to the AP, and then the user is able to um, respond to that notification. But it really, you know, part of the reason we haven't really talked much about the hybrid interface is because it really shouldn't be visible to the user what's going on. It's really a set of tools that we provide OEMs to enable them to get to better battery life. Hmm. Yeah, something I've really noticed when I was using the OnePlus Watch 2 um, over the past couple of days, like I would get a notification and it really does, as, as you mentioned, this is supposedly running on the microcontroller unit or the MCU, but I don't actually notice that it's running on the completely custom RTOS that's on this smartwatch versus Wear OS that's powered by the more powerful applications processor or AP. And I'm really impressed by how that's been done. And I'm kind of curious to hear if these APIs that are provided currently by the hybrid OS interface, the display health services and notifications, if there will be others coming in the future, or if that's what we're working with um, for the foreseeable future right now. Oh, it's definitely an area that we're continuing to, you know, iterate and, and learn on their, their capabilities that our OEMs are asking us to add to the hybrid interface. Um, I think in particular, as you get into these transitions between display control, where the MCU is sometimes controlling the display and the AP is sometimes controlling the display, that's you know that's where um, it gets really tricky because you've got to make sure that that transition is is so seamless. You don't want the user to have to notice it, and um, and that that there's there's definitely some some improvements in that area that we think we can still make um, to enable even more seamless transitions to. Um, also enable more capabilities on the MCU so that more of the use cases that our OEMs want to be able to power from the MCU can actually be driven there and driven with similar fidelity. And I, I think one of the things that's really important to us is these watches are, 
you know, if they're 50%, I, the way I like to think about them is like 50% functional, like they need to do helpful things for people, but they're also a piece of jewelry. So, you know, they need to be beautiful. And, um, and so really being able to make, uh, continue to make the watches really have this premium, beautiful jewelry like feeling whilst also optimizing battery life is actually a pretty fun challenge. It's pretty complicated to do and definitely will be, you know, investing more in the hybrid interface to enable uh, more of that beauty to come through in a way that also optimizes for battery life. I wanted to follow up a bit about the um, exact capabilities of this hybrid interface. So in the blog post, um, it's mentioned that this enables more power efficient experiences such as sense of data processing on the MCU while the application processor is kept asleep. I wanted to ask, like, is there a specific kind of pole limit on the sensor data collection or can it be effectively continuous? Because I was wondering if it might be possible to build more complex features um, running entirely on the MCU, such as sensor data collection for car crash detection. And, you know, that requires continuous monitoring of like microphone, of accelerometer data and gyroscope and being able to have all that running on a super power efficient MCU would be much more beneficial than having that run on something more power hungry like the the main uh, AP. Yeah, it's a great question, Michelle. And, and like, I mean, a lot to unpack there. I, for sure, like on, on the one hand, these these microcontrollers are great for always on sort of low compute complexity tasks. Um, it, but there is actually a threshold beyond which you know if the compute complexity gets too high. Um, then the AP is actually both more performant and more power efficient. And so making sure that we're running the right compute jobs in the right place is really the, the key thing here. And um, and certainly, you know, in, in I think pretty much every watch architecture that I'm familiar with, the MCU is generally running all the time. Usually it's some, maybe it's some lower clock speed, but it's doing things like um, collecting your heart rate on a continuous basis or steps on a continuous basis. Um, and, you know, obviously with the user's permission and at the user's request, but most users like to have that feature enabled. And once they do, the MCU is there doing that job all the time. And, and to your point, um, you know, even just the normal sort of tilt to wake gesture that you make with the watch needs to have um, the gyro, the IMU, the, the gyro and the accelerometer running all the time. Those are usually connected to the MCU. So usually the MCU is on for even those basic type of um, gesture detection. Uh, and so then having other tasks run on the MCU when the MCU is on makes sense. Um, and, uh, and certainly since it's running, the more tasks you can take care of there without turning the MCU effectively into an AP um, is, 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 a, is, a, is a way to approach that problem. So certainly um, these MCUs are actually pretty capable and it is definitely possible to run some pretty advanced machine learning algorithms on low power MCUs, like such as models built with TensorFlow Lite Micro. Um, they can be run on an MCU. And so that can enable some of these types of scenarios, whether it's a, an improved heart rate algo or it's an improved distance tracking algo, which you know generally involves not only you know fusing GNSS, but also uh, inertial motion algos so that you can uh, dead reckon when you go out of GPS coverage and things like that. Those types of algos can be improved with running AI. And that AI, if it's a small enough model, can run um, on the MCU. When it comes to something like car crash detection, it all depends on whether or not the model can be made accurate enough and small enough and the compute complexity can be light enough that it makes sense to run it on an MCU. We'll have to see um, how you know, how folks do with, with being able to get a model onto a watch like that. Um, but in theory, those types of things are possible. And in practice, you know, those types of algos are already used on an MCU on an always on basis for these types of tasks, like detecting whether or not you've tilted your wrist and doing that very accurately, or, um, you know, improving the quality of your heart rate or, or, or distance or step calculation. Or like fall detection on the pixel watch. Yes. Yeah. Fall detection is another one that, would sent would fuse sensors together and and that type of algorithm can run on an MCU. Yeah, yeah. I think you know at the end of the day, what I'm realizing as I'm, I'm listening to you kind of talk about all this is, um, you know, again, touching back on what we started with. At the end of the day, 
the general user of these devices just wants better performance, wants longer lasting performance. And what's going on under the hood seems to tackle that. What I also realize is that, you know, our, our fans, the people who watch and listen to Android Faithful, there, it's a mixture of the developer people, you know, the, the people who really understand the under the hood kind of uh, mechanics of all of this working. And then there's the user, the person that just really enjoys Android and wants a better device. Yeah. So if you had to break this down and kind of spell spell this out for the, just the basic, the, the user of the watch to, to know like what activities are that they're doing are powered by the MCU compared to the application processor and like how that improves their kind of uh, their their perspective on their experience if that makes sense well i mean i think the first thing um the, the first thing i'd say is like i think the fundamental thing here is that we can put all kinds of fancy you know capabilities into a watch but if we you know run out of power before the user gets through the day they're not going to rely on the watch. It's effectively not going to be a useful device because you're yeah. not sure, you know, you're just creating way too much anxiety for people. And so it's really, really important that we get to trusted battery life and trusted battery life for me is like, is your watch there for you on your worst day, right? Like if you think of a friend who's trusted, they're going to be there on your worst day. And so that's where we need to get to in my mind with with smartwatches is your smartwatch has got to be there for you on your worst day, your worst battery day. In fact, that the day that's going to drain, um, you know, the most battery life. And if it can't do that, then every other, any bit of functionality it does, that's kind of cool or neat is actually kind of a parlor trick. It's not super helpful at the end of the day. So, um, that's, that's ultimately where we need to get to the, you know, at, you know, as to your question, like about what runs where, it really varies by by OEM and what they imp implement where. But I will say that, you know, pretty much everybody makes use of um, of, for example, the health hybrid interface, and so it just makes a lot of sense to have um, things like your your step count and your heart rate uh, running off a microcontroller and not running on the on the application processor. Um, some OEMs use uh, the microcontroller to to run certain parts of the display, typically for um, long running use cases, right? Because if you can, it's it is um, it's it's expensive to run the AP and it's um, expensive to start it up, not because it's inefficient, but because it's designed for really complex computations. Um, and so it's sort of like a big engine in a car. Like if you can run it on the little electric engine for a little while, um, and we don't really have to do a job that's really that hard, then it makes more sense to use the electric engine until we've really got to, you know, get up to speed and pass a car, you know, then we, mm. then we turn on the big V8 and, and, and go really fast. And it's using the right engine for the right job or the right, the right CPU for the right, uh, you know, the right, uh, job at the end of the day. If you, you can imagine, for example, like, you know, a, in, at the end of the day, um, like a stopwatch doesn't isn't really very computationally complex, right? It really probably shouldn't be running on the AP. Now, in most cases, I think pretty much every case on a Wear OS watch, the stopwatch runs that I'm that I can think of runs on the AP today. That's something we should get to at some point. That you know, a use case like that where you just set a tea timer, um, you know, maybe doesn't need to be something that's being kept track of on a on an application process. It's a little bit over spec for that job, if you will. Whereas like opening the Play Store, updating apps, you know, maybe navigating in maps, like some of those really complex tasks, they're just actually, you're gonna get better battery life actually running them on an application processor because they're inherently complicated. Um, and and the AP is, is more power efficient uh, for those complex tasks. Talking about the whole race to idle um, approach, where you get the complex task done as quickly as possible and go back to sleep with the processor, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and there are tasks that you know that are in um, uh, that we wake up the AP for today that are not super complex, complicated, and those are on you know on our list of of things to get to to move them out of the AP. But they're 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 not e It's it's uh, it's complicated. Uh, most of the, the the challenge to get to battery bat battery life is not a big silver bullet. It's it it actually takes a tremendous amount of work uh, up and down from silicon to glass, from you know the work we do with our silicon providers to 
how our OEMs assemble the watches to what we do in Wear OS, and uh, together we'll get there. Um, but it's it's uh, it, it it definitely takes a high level of collaboration, you know, across uh, across the ecosystem. I wanted to ask you a bit about one of the capabilities mentioned in the hybrid OS interface is the ability to support certain watch faces. And I believe the blog post specifically said only so some watch faces are supported by the hybrid OS interface. Could you elaborate a bit on whether or not um, this is about whether the watch face is built only in the watch face format or yeah. if all watch faces could be capable of being upgraded to support the hybrid OS interface? That's a great question, Michelle. I, I, the, the legacy watch faces, the ones that are based on Android X, are basically like many applications. And so um, they need all the APIs that are available in the, you know, effectively in the Android system. And if we were to take those APIs and have them run on the MCU, then the MCU would be a mini AP and it would kind of defeat the purpose. So the advantage of the watch face format is that it's declarative, which means that it's the, the watch face itself doesn't need to run um, developer specific code. And that allows you to run the watch face effectively or for the watch face to be what we call system managed, meaning that the, the system takes care of running that watch face. That opens the door for that watch face to be rendered either on the AP or potentially on the MCU. Now, the next limiting factor that you run into is that um, some of those watch faces are then um, can be quite large in their assets. They're you know depending on um, how big the the assets or the images that are in that underlying watch face, there has to be space for those. And um, you know in most cases, the MCUs inside these watches have fairly limited storage. Now that's a problem we're working on with with uh, with our OEM partners to come up with more flexible memory structures to enable future watches to be able to take advantage of more of the watch faces that are out there. Um, but in the, in the near term, the storage that's directly available to the MCU is often quite limited. And so what the point we were trying to make with the, the blog post was that this watch face format does open up the possibility of being able to run more of these watches watch faces on more watches on the MCU, uh, but it very much will depend on how much memory is available to the MCU as to which watch faces will be able to run when. Now, of course, the user will get the benefit of better battery life when, when we are able to run one of those watch faces on the MCU. Otherwise, the developer and the user shouldn't know um, or have to do anything different in order to get that capability. It's something that will work together with OEMs to um, you know, make sure that the watch face can at least run on the AP. And if we're able to move it to the MCU because there's enough storage uh, available on the MCU, then that's something we would obviously want to do. Um, and, and, you know, clearly, you know, like we talked about, like these watches are jewelry, so we don't want to just make the watch faces really simple and, you know, cut the assets out. We want them to be beautiful. And so there is a real balance to get right there to make sure that we continue to enable um, users to have the most beautiful possible watch and watch face whilst also um, you know meeting this fundamental need of having trusted battery life at the end of the day yeah indeed now um to kind of wrap things up i guess a, a big question that a lot of people are going to have if they're watching the announcements and kind of you know reading and, and listening today to the to this news so much of it, at least from OnePlus's perspective, <laughs> is tied to the OnePlus Watch too. What about other Wear OS users? Um, is any of this really hardware dependent in ways that might actually prevent some of these improvements from hitting some other watches that are already out there that uh, could you know, potentially be upgraded to enjoy some of these improvements? Um, what's, the, what's the view there? Well, we, you know, so much of what's in Wear OS 4 is generally available for, mm -hmm. you know, for watch users that will either upgrade to, to Wear 3 or, you know, buy a new watch, which is based on, on Wear 4. Um, and so there are, for example, power improvements that we haven't talked about in this launch that are in Wear, in Wear OS 4, uh, that do lead to better battery life, um, as well as the other capabilities that we talked about in terms of transferring to a phone and, and those types of, those types of capabilities. We spent a lot of time talking about the the hybrid interface um, here because the note specifically the the notification hybrid interface is something we work very closely on with 
with OnePlus on their watch announcement. And when it comes to the hybrid interface, it is something that depends very much on each individual OEM's uh, underlying watch architecture um, and their power strategy. So uh, unfortunately, I guess in some senses, it depends based on um, you know what those underlying watch architectures are as to how much of the hybrid interface might be adopted in Wear OS 4 by OEM. On the other hand, we like we've talked about, we really don't want this to be something that users need to unduly worry about. And mm. in some cases, you know, OEMs will have other ways of achieving better battery life that may not make full use of one sub portion of the hybrid interface. Um, I would not be surprised though, if we don't see more OEMs adopting, for example, the notification um, hybrid interface, um, you know, because generally we're, we're working closely with OEMs and anyone who comes up with a great idea of how to improve battery life, that's really top of our list mm -hmm. to want to collaborate with them on. And we're really thrilled to work with Oppo on it. They were very excited about it. Um, and, you know, we welcome that kind of innovation. So I, when it comes to battery life, we're, we're excited to take on the best ideas from across the ecosystem. And I think that's one of the beautiful things about being part of an ecosystem, right? We have, um, you know, we have a number of really competent partners out there who have great ideas and we can collaborate together to bring those ideas to fruition all in the service of more trustable battery life for users. I think that's a that's a great thing at the end of the day. Yeah. At the end of the day, that's a huge win for everyone because that's what we all want at the end yeah. of the day. Bjorn Kilburn is VP of Wear OS uh, at Google. And Bjorn, it was a pleasure meeting you today. Thank you for carving out some time on a Monday uh, to talk to us about Wear OS and everything you guys are doing. We'd love to have you back sometime. Absolutely. My pleasure, Jason and Michelle. Thank you very much. It's great to see you both. Absolutely. We will yeah. talk to you soon and keep up the great work, Bjorn. All right. Thanks. All right. Give me one second to bring everybody back here. Welcome back to the room, everybody. What a great conversation, you guys. I'm bummed I missed it. Unfortunately, yeah, I was I'm doing- Yeah, I'm bummed I missed it too. I was doing DTNS at the exact same time as you were talking to Bjorn. Oh, so it was like- Family plug. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thanks. The big special thanks to Google PR for putting this together so quickly. Like, it was just like a Friday afternoon. I reached out, hey, can we yeah. get someone? And they're like, yeah, we can get Bjorn. I'm like, really? Seriously? It was jackpot. And then just yeah, over the weekend, <laughs> we got yeah. this all scheduled out. And especially, I mean, the timing is really good because the technology that Bjorn was talking about is so relevant to this moment in wearables for Android, as we will talk about coming up next. All right, Michelle, uh, you know, everything that Bjorn Kilburn was talking about really, you know, at least directly now ties into this new hardware announcement from Mobile World Congress from OnePlus, the OnePlus Watch 2. I'm wearing one on my wrist because they sent Ooh. me one for review, but I haven't reviewed it yet. I know you've got one on your wrist too. Oh man, I feel left out. Yeah, yeah, you I know. and I are getting the short end of the stick here. <laughs> yeah, you're just not part of this party. <laughs> well, you are because you're here with the Android faithful, but uh, Michelle, what are your thoughts? Uh, I Well, I think I kind of want to tell people about the hardware itself first, yeah. right? Before I dive into my hands-on. So sure. just for a bit of a recap, OnePlus, did unveil the OnePlus Watch 2 at Mobile World Congress. This is their second ever smartwatch, hence the name, but it's actually their first to run Wear OS. Um, it runs Wear OS 4 out of the box and includes all the hybrid OS interface um, improvements that we just heard extensively about from Bjorn. And thanks to these improvements, coupled with the huge 500 milliamp hour battery relative to other Wear OS smartwatches, OnePlus says that this device can last up to 100 hours, 100 hours in the default smart mode. Um, there's also a dedicated power saving mode that can boost that up to 12 days of battery life. And this is possible, again, because of that dual chipset architecture with the hybrid OS improvements that we just talked about. And um, this device has two chipsets. The first one is the Qualcomm Snapdragon W5 Gen 1 that's powering Wear OS. And the second tent, second one is the Best Technic BES2700 chip, which you've probably never heard of. Um, that's because this is a chip that's typically found in hearable products like TDFS earbuds. And this one is powering um, Oppo's custom RTOS real-time operating system. We don't know what it's called. It doesn't really have a name, but this is the ultra low power operating system that is um, on the microcontroller unit that is like constantly seamlessly switching between Wear OS and this operating system to save power. 
And that and RTOS, that, that was that was the underpinning of the original OnePlus watch, right? Like because it wasn't running Wear OS. It RTS was is kind RTOS. of like a generic term, like mm-hmm. for any like um, super low um, complex real time operating system running on like these kind of devices. Uh, so they didn't really give a name for this specific RTOS, but that's just what it is. Mm-hmm. Um, apart from the software, there's also you know the hardware, which I'll show you in a second. As a 1.43 inch AMOLED display, dual frequency GPS for precise location tracking, heart rate sensor, oximeter, two gigs of RAM, 32 gigs of storage, um, VOOC fast charging support. It doesn't support LTE or some advanced health features like ECG or blood pressure monitoring, but it does have Oppo's revamped OHealth app that supports um, over 100 sports tracking modes, sleep analysis, and more. And if you're interested in picking up the OnePlus Watch 2, you can get it um, on pre order right now through March 4th for 299 US dollars or 399 Canadian dollars. And OnePlus is again offering a crazy trade in any device or specifically any watch in any condition until the 31st and you'll get $50 off. And it's crazy. now it's for- crazy. Like two, making it like their whole trade in thing I'd love just cause it's bananas and just like totally crazy. But like the fact that the watch at 299 I feel like is priced in the right zone for what it's bringing with it from a spec standpoint, but you can get 50 bucks off that. Like the one plus, like I, I love the aggressiveness of go. It shows the confidence they have in the product. Right. So. And now for what you all are waiting for the actual hands-on of the one plus watch do, does it actually live up to the hype? So I've had the device in its black steel finish for about six days now. So while I can't offer a full review. I can share some detail first impressions first things first. How does it actually feel to use? Well, it is considerably larger than my Pixel Watch 2, which I have right here. Um, it might not be that chonker. easy to see in this, but it is, it's is—it's chonker. Yeah, mm. it is much yes. wider. But surprisingly, um, it doesn't b- actually bother me, mostly because I, I do have big wrists. So even though it has a 47 millimeter case size and is heavier to wear, I've been able to wear 24-7 without much issue, even while sleeping. I do plan on changing this um, default 22 millimeter rubber strap with a third party one. Um, I, I like those soft nylon Velcro straps like the one I have here for the Pixel Watch 2. I just prefer the comfort of those things, so I'm gonna switch that out. And it does support third party um, watch band, so you can do that. Uh, in, in terms of the actual hardware, it has this circular display. It does have like some thick bezels. It's not like curved. It's a completely flat display. It has two buttons on the side, a, sorry, a home button here and a multifunction button down here. The home button is in the form of a rotating crown, and you can rotate it, but when you rotate it, it doesn't actually do anything. Like, it doesn't actually scroll your notifications or do anything, which is kind of weird. Um, But, uh, you know, it doesn't really bother me that much. I don't really use the crown. But um, if you uh, go into settings, you can remap what the buttons do, because right now, by default, they do the typical Wear OS actions. You can long press the home to open assistant, double tap the multifunction button to open wallet, and... um, Speaking of things you can change, the app list by default is a watchOS style app grid, which I know like will make some of you roll your eyes like, oh, of course, they had to copy Apple on that. Hmm. But fortunately, you can go into settings and change it to a grid or list view. And as, as you can saw, if you're watching the video feed, performance has been really snappy for me. Like I haven't noticed any noticeable transitions when switching between Wear OS and RTOS. It's pretty seamless as Google and OnePlus are advertising. Like when you get a notification, it's technically running on the R2S, but like you don't even notice it when you're actually interacting with a notification or um, sending a reply or anything like that. You can manually access the R2S by entering power saving mode. I'm not going to do that right here because that actually requires a reboot. So I don't want to make you wait for that. Uh, but if I were to show you, it basically looks exactly like Wear OS, except you can't access Wear OS apps and some features like smart reply, oxygen saturation tracking, voice guidance, and some watch faces and complications just aren't available. Now, the battery life, which is the key gimmick, the key feature of the OnePlus Watch 2. It's been nothing short of amazing for me. On the first cycle alone, it lasted 75 hours in smart mode. And that included all the setup time that I had for this watch. Downloading the software, downloading a whole bunch of apps from Google Play, downloaded an entire YouTube music library for offline playback, did about like two hours of outdoor GPS tracking with music playback, and um, and the end, like when the watch dropped down to 10% battery, it automatically triggered power saving mode for me. And then when I left it on overnight in power saving mode, it didn't drop a single percent when I went to bed and then woke up um, like, like 10 hours later. Uh, it's worth noting that 
a lot of features like AOD, oxygen saturation, monitoring during sleep, they're not enabled by default when um, in the default mode with Smart Saber mode. But uh, I would wager that this is basically a three to four day watch with all its defense, with all its default settings. But if you enable everything like AOD and all those sensors, I could imagine this lasted two full days with everything enabled. But I'd need to actually do more testing to verify that. Regardless, um, because of how fast it charges, it, I don't think it really matters like whether it lasts two, three, or four days. Like Because you can plug it in for an hour um, into this, this charger right here. It I, I was about to ask you about the charger. That, that, looks, yeah. that, that looks like a really good charger. Yeah, it connects pretty seamlessly. It even supports USB data transfer. If you're a developer, you'll be happy to hear that. And um, only about an hour is needed to fully charge it. Like I, I think I left it on the charger for like 50 minutes, and it reached 80% from just uh, 0%. And that was with a non-ideal charger. I plugged it into my computer's USB port because I just didn't. I just couldn't bother because this cable is not very long, so I didn't want to plug it into a wall. But, but hang on. <laughs> I mean, the, the the time to charge is great, but put, show the charger again, though. I'm 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 harping on the charger because the miserable experience of the Google Pixel Watch Two. Um, does that disconnect from the cable? So the, the little puck. Yes, it does. It's not. It's not. So um, all you need to do is bring that puck with you, and yep. you're. Oh yeah. That's so cool. That's yeah, so and it's a yeah. USB C insert that goes into the puck. So you um, just bring yep. whatever whatever USB C cable on the road that you use to charge your phone, and you bring that puck, and you could swap it out very easily. That that's so much better than this. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah. Yeah. Good <laughs> yeah, job. That's one true. Plus. But yeah. but I will also say you know the the annoying aspect of the the Pixel uh, watch. Uh, charger or puck or whatever yeah. that is kind of floppy and, yeah, and whatever you got to line it up right mm -hmm. i mean you have the same thing here it's oh just, okay. but it looks like these, it looks a little more formidable like and it looks a little more easier to line up and it looks a little more i don't know it, that looks like an i would rather have that over the pixel watch 2 one so and just some final thoughts if i had to mention any complaints it's that software support is limited to two years which um, compared to the galaxy watch and pixel watch is less than what they offer some nice these like do not disturb mode doesn't sync with a non OnePlus phone that I have paired to it. The vibration strength is pretty weak. The speaker isn't that loud, so I couldn't really take a call in a busy place like a Costco. And auto workout detection just didn't work the time I tried it. Although I like like I said, I've only had it for a couple of days, so I need to try test it out more. Everything else I tested, like I did verify, was pretty accurate, like GPS tracking, sleep detection, step counter, the heart rate and oxygen saturation sensors. Um, but like I said, I need to spend more time with this device to really offer a definitive review on it. But just in the brief period that I've had it so far, it's already become my favorite Wear OS smartwatch. And I'll definitely keep using this over my Pixel Watch 2 for the foreseeable future. Wow. Cool. Not I'm impressed. That. Yeah, I only got mine um, this weekend and kind of had it set up, got it set up yesterday. So... Um, so I, I haven't really had much time with it on my wrist at all. But I will say that the, it's a stark contrast from a feeling perspective on the wrist and from just a sheer size from the Pixel Watch 2 that I've become really used to wearing on a daily basis. Uh, and then going to this, I'm like, man, this thing's heavier. Oh, it's bigger. You know, it just everything about it feels more. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I'm I'm kind of on the fence on on what on how I feel about that. So I'm really curious to see. You know, I want to give it a couple of weeks and and do you know like you, Michelle. I want to do kind of like a thoughtful, um, kind of experiential review um, with it. Cool. Well, but um, it it's a chonker, like we said. Even Jason on your wrist, it looks. Junker. It looks normal, oh. but you have you are a very large man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but large watches generally look okay on my wrist. Yeah, um, has has been my notice. And so then, what it comes down to for me is like, how does it feel for me to be wearing a watch of this size? And right. I think I'm just I've just become so used to kind of like the smaller, kind of compact, rounded quality of the Pixel Watch too, because this doesn't have a whole lot of rounding to it. I mean, it's a round watch. But like Michelle said, the glass is very flat, um, and I don't know. There, there's it lacks a certain kind of like elegant contour 
to it. Some some of the edges feel a little too sharp for my preference. That might not be the case for everyone, though. Well, it was funny because I was scrolling through my Google News feed this morning and I saw the headline of an article about the OnePlus 2 watch that was uh, uh, first look, the OnePlus Watch 2 is too big for my tiny wrists. And before I even saw that it was Gizmodo, I'm like, that's flow. <laughs> and sure yeah. enough, it was by I another mean, of the Florence Ions first sure. look on uh, uh, Gizmodo uh, where she zeroes in on the wrist size. Uh, so when I imagine you align probably closer with Flo than Jason yeah. and Michelle here. Right? Um, I, I'm really interested, by the way, also uh, Killbot404 in Discord right before you mentioned her article was like, oh, I wonder how what Flo would think about the watch. Um, yeah, I have to admit, like, so I, especially with like the new Wear OS features that, you know, we kind of mentioned earlier, I, I am, I want to try it for Japan for the transit. And yeah, I'm I'm just like Flo. I've had big, huge, chunky watch, watch chunky watches, chunky, chunky, chunky watches, watches. <laughs> chunky watches, chunky watches, <laughs> a chunk, a twonk. I've had I've had twonks. That that doesn't twonks. Anyway, chunky watches. Can't portmanteau that crap, man. Um, I've had a chunky watch before, and I mean. I love the software. Like I had like a Withings for a long time. I really tried to make it work. Um, it was one of the Google watches back in the day that Withings did. It was just, it's just too heavy. I try to use it for workouts and, and detection. And because it's so heavy, it, it's not flush to my wrist. So it, it tends to interfere with like the fitness things. And again, it's like maybe five years ago, but the fact that it's a big watch versus a, a tiny wrist, like, and I, I have tiny wrist too, is I don't, I don't know if the current technology can, you know, make up for that. So I'm with flow. I need a smaller smaller small, like i need watches for smaller wits and and yeah granted it's got a lot of tech in it it's going to be only so small but hmm. tiny wrists are very common y'all i mean it's <laughs> it's fi f nearly 50 percent of the population or right? over 50 percent of mean... the population i i am curious why no i mean it's got to be you know market share and all stuff like that but just like make a commitment and do a, a, a smartwatch for women just do it just, someone do it just smaller just and smaller. let's see what Please, let's see what yeah. happens take a risk I don't know Please. what Half what does a smartwatch for women mean though, and I know mm. you know what I mean. Like, is, does it mean that it's a smaller watch, or does it mean that it's a pretty watch, or no, what? So you know I what think, I mean? I think that it's a small, it's a physically smaller, smaller display, but it feels more comfortable on the smaller wrist. I think that's yeah. the that's the thing. You're trying to pack in all this stuff and all this functionality, and you know, when for for would you rather have? a watch that feels normal like the one you're wearing right now which is th th that gave yeah. you that gave you some or whatever you know that, that yeah size whatever it is it, yeah yeah um that gives some that gives smartphone smart watch um access or not or a big watch that you'll never buy like that's what i, I don't know i, I mean just, the answer is this like that's yeah. why i it's comfortable it doesn't yeah. slip and you know i do care about the fitness features and this it, while it's not perfect, you know, actually is always co in contact with my skin. So does the data. So what watch is that again? It's not a watch. It's a whoop. It's just it's a, a fitness whoop. tracker. So it's like oh, a, okay. it's, it has okay. no screen. Um, But I, I miss okay. it. And, that, and the reason I tried so hard with that Withings Chonker was because I liked having all the Wear OS features. I liked having navigation with me on my wrist. I liked having all that. But it, it just wasn't viable. Like, and it just wasn't comfortable. And there was no way there's no way in heck I was wearing it through the night to measure my, right. my oh sleep. totally i yeah. cannot no in a million years imagine no wearing like, this I, thing to sleep over, like, yeah. so and to answer your question jason i don't think it's a pink wristband or a rose gold bezel it's just yeah. a smaller display Physi that, just physically that, yeah yeah it's a pixel watch yeah. too i mean yeah. The Pixel Watch and the Pixel Watch 2 are both the same size, right? They're that smaller display. It's interesting to me that some companies, Google, has opted to produce the smartwatch in the smaller size that maybe appeals to more people, but is going to turn off, you know, some hardcore, you know, yeah. some some dudes that just want to be a chonker on their wrist. You know what I mean? Chonker. That does everything and lasts forever. And yeah, it's just interesting how they take how they take the sides. The OnePlus obviously is taking the larger do everything. Uh, kind of approach and maybe yeah. someday they offer multiple sizes on I'd be willing to listen to numbers like if someone out there is able to share numbers about like maybe and it's not all about gender but there is some correlation between gender and wrist size I think it's fair to say yeah maybe is there numbers out there that just show that I don't know people of smaller wrists are not buying watches yeah don't yeah I, <laughs> I, I don't know what it is I, I would just like to know thank yeah. you yep interesting somebody tell us all right. Well, Michelle, great first look at that watch. It's pretty cool. I'm intrigued. Um, yeah, OnePlus doing doing well, I think. Yeah.
So. Yeah. And speaking of OnePlus, I went into in-depth little promo. If you listen to yesterday's uh, episode of Daily Tech News Show, February 26th episode, I was on the show with me and Tom Merritt, and we went in-depth on what's going on with OnePlus, this kind of resurgence between the OnePlus Open, OnePlus 12, now the OnePlus Watch. You, you know, you've got this ecosystem now that OnePlus is kind of uh, entering uh, and what's so attractive about them. And we haven't even mentioned that the, they've got the OnePlus 12R Genshin uh, Impact Edition mm. uh, coming up. I think we'll talk about that next week. But um, yeah, it just it's OnePlus is on fire right now. So bravo to them. Yeah, Chonky lot. watch aside, Flo. <laughs> so. All right. We got so much hardware. We got so much more to go. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. yeah. We, we've only scratched <laughs> the surface. That was one thing. That yeah. was one story. Yep. Uh, when you've got the next one. Yeah. And this is very, something I'm going to keep my eye on. And so we're getting even more looks at what the Pixel Fold 2 might look like. I'm super interested. So this is actually not a, an official look at the Pixel Fold 2, but on leaks in collaboration with Oh, my notes missed it. Uh, Smart Pricks, sorry. Smart Pricks and Onleaks have collaborated on 5K 360 degree video uh, that is a render of the Pixel Fold, and they have some specs to go with it. So you kind of, you know, and, and I, I feel like Onleaks has been pretty on point. Onleaks mm -hmm. is on point uh, with, you know, their leaks for sure over the, you know, many years. Uh, and so I don't know. I'm willing to take this with more than just a grain of salt or less salt. I don't know if you are someone with hypertension, but yeah, there, there's a, there's quite a bit that is different about the Pixel Fold. And yeah, I think what stands out most is, of course, the form factor um, and also the camera bump. So it is going to be a larger phone than the Pixel than the OG Pixel, it, it, Pixel Fold, this is to believe. Um, the OG Pixel Fold was 5.8 inches. The front screen is 5.8 inches diagonal. Uh, when closed, open screen, the inner screen rather is 7.6 inches. The Pixel 2 renders uh, have it sh have it being constructed at a 6.4 inch screen on the outside, and then the inner screen being 7.9, so a little bit bigger all the way. Um, something that they do show too is that. Uh, allegedly, the Pixel Fold 2 will be thinner, though. Not quite as thin as, you know, your Honor V Magic 2s or anything, but compared to the OG Pixel at 12.1 millimeters, they're dropping like a whole, like, mil like millimeter and a half down to 10.5. So not, again, not quite as thin as the Honor, but get getting thinner. So, like, wider and, like, thinner. I don't know how that works, but it, it just does. Like, bigger screens, but, like, thinner when folded. So you said 10.5, um, 10 10.5 millimeters thin, thin when unfolded? When, or, sorry, right? when, when folded. So, like, when whatever folded. the... When folded, right. Okay. Unfold, sorry. When unfolded, it's, like, 5.24, 5.4, something like that. Which is so, thinner than wow. the OnePlus Open, which I was, is that's super what I was thin. just looking at. Yeah, exactly. yeah my bad. My bad. Um, yeah. No, so, no, yeah. no. That's that's interesting to me, because yeah. that's yeah. one of the things that I've, I've loved about yeah. the OnePlus Open. Is it's so thin. thin. It's, it's so, thin. like, so if thin. they can get thinner, man, yeah. if phones, if generally phones can get thinner and keep the battery life, we're going in the right direction, everybody. So. Yeah, I mean, with bigger screens, too. So it is just really just going, leaning into that foldable advantage of just mo screen, just mo screen, more everything. This seems familiar, Michelle. <laughs> that's right um because <laughs> it looks almost identical to the photo that i obtained the pixel fold 2 and posted on android right. authority a couple yeah, weeks it ago and, yep. it, and it does have that uh it has it is moving away from the horizontal camera bar in the back to make a little you know two killed island. rectangular island i mm. mean i'm not too worried about this as a current fold user because cases just cover everything up but it is it is a it is a shift in the design language from you know that very iconic pixel bar that we've seen for the last how many years now yeah. and I don't know. Like, are they just chasing OnePlus, or are they just trying that, a new design language? Like, and that's the question. Like, I saw a lot of criticism of this online. I saw a couple oh. of articles, a couple of think pieces, something yeah. like that, where they said that like Google's throwing in the towel. They're foldable, or they're just chasing whatever they're do. They're doing whatever. But like, I after using the OnePlus Open and like sampling the Samsungs and sampling the Pixel Fold, I feel like OnePlus was in the right direction in terms of what the right foldable form factor was for the book style, mm -hmm. you know, Molesky, digital Moleskine style yeah. one. I think this is the right direction for Google to go in personally. If, if it is bigger, I mean, like I, I still like the landscape when open aspect ratio, but I do think this looks wider and I don't have a OnePlus open. I need to fix that. I mean, you're gonna steal my husband's or buy my own. And I do think that this does look like a good compromise. That's about as much as I'll say to it. I'm going to get my hands on one at some point. But yeah, it looks a little wider than the Z Fold. So it kind of is a good, mm -hmm. I mean, and, and that's the thing though. Like if they aren't, I mean, I, I loved the tablet 
tablet landscape aspect ratio of the inner screen. But if I'm the only one, then what's Google going to do? They're going to they're going to do what works. And well, the OnePlus Open has been just unabashedly positive, positively reviewed. Right. So I, I don't hate them for this at all. Um, and yeah, like that's pretty much what we got so far. The, there's this color colorway. It's going to be called charcoal, uh, you know, in the in the history of cute slash interesting artistic colorway names and oh here's one thing that i don't like is that the renders show the inner camera being under mm. display i was gonna ask you about that i hate okay i really hate it because the z fold under display camera is just the inner camera is a freaking potato and i really really it's, it's, it's just not good it's it just like it, daily use. It, i mean it's better than a camera from 2000 and 10 2009 oh, but it's just well, kind of a horrible comparison well especially yeah. for how much you pay for it well yeah for like, sure i don't i don't is know it worth it? is it worth not having that little dot there like I, the dot i don't even see it i don't, like, I don't yeah care. i don't i don't maybe like as long as they don't do the pin i, I don't know like it, it looks actually like it is a cutaway rather than a pinhole camera which is like is that the, is that the term for the z fold one where it had like that little weird like overlay where it tries yeah. to like if it's not that then it's fine but i i just i i'm over i think the idea out. is that you if you want to take an actual selfie you flip the phone around and you take it using the rear cameras because you can do that with a, mm -hmm. a it's a better it's a better and camera the, system yeah significantly better yeah. but the inner screen under display camera is purely just for like video calls yeah. and like, that's like uh, it's all you're supposed I, to use I, I and eventually and eventually eye tracking and like yeah, any stuff that like they that. need for that and that sort of thing you know yeah so, i will yeah. say i am 100 percent like a big fan of the rear camera selfie but i as an actual like 100 percent pixel fold user it is not always practical y'all to like yeah. flip it around but yeah. that that's i mean that's fair they're, they're gonna put all their eggs the camera eggs in the back basket and leave the front for whatever but we'll see i'll i'm almost assuredly gonna get one so this is I'm complaining for nothing. I don't know. <laughs> just... Well, these are still leaks. These are still, it's still early. I mean, like, when did they announce the Pixel Fold last year? It was a May announcement. It was May. a Google I.O. announcement, right? Yeah. yeah. So mm -hmm. so we'll see if they keep on that schedule and if we, we this becomes real in a couple of months, right? So. Getting realer. Rendered. I just realized, by the way, earlier today, I was like, I was like, what are the dates for Google I.O.? Because, like, May is looking to be really busy for me. Yeah. And, I was like, and they're not out yet. And I'm getting really stressed out now because I'm like, shit. Right. Oh, boy. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah it's coming up. You yeah. Blink, it's going to be here. Yeah. Hopefully, so. we can all make it again. Yeah. Hopefully, yeah. hopefully we're all invited again. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I think I feel like we're actually surprisingly. Yeah. I feel like we're in better position than we were a year ago when we got invited last year. So yeah, hopefully, knock yeah. on wood, Google, we love you. We'd love to hang out with you again. So absolutely, <laughs> love it, love it. So. Um, okay, more Mobile World Congress news, and uh, I don't think MWC would be MWC without something from Xiaomi. Uh, unveiled the Xiaomi 14. There, there's a number of releases here, basically. And so I, I probably won't show a screenshot of everything because I'm driving right now, but not driving a car. I'm driving the, the show. <laughs> That'd be amazing Lots if you were driving a car driving. while we're <laughs> Android don't, Auto's coming a long way. Don't drive in podcast, y'all. <laughs> don't drive yeah, in podcast. Definitely don't do that. Um, but uh, let's see here. Xiaomi 14 scheduled for global release. This was actually released in China last year. Uh, but it's going to get a global release. Snapdragon 8 Gen 3, 16 gigs of RAM up to anyways, up to two, one terabyte of storage, 6.36 inch AMOLED with 120 hertz. You know, all the, all the stuff you expect, 3000 nits in sunlight, rectangular camera bump. And I'm showing for video listeners um, kind of like the, well, I guess it's more like a square camera bump. But anyways, you're seeing it. Uh, aluminum frame. And then they uh, last week uh, had unveiled in China the 14 Ultra. So this week they announced the global launch of that. That is the one that you see here in the center. It is the large circular camera bump with Leica optics. All four cameras are 50 megapixels. Uh, the main cam lens is a one inch uh, sensor with stepless variable aperture. So it goes anywhere from f1.6 to f4.0. So that's going to be real good and, you know, mm. probably give you some really uh, great shots and low light and be able to be very flexible. It does have, if you can see, if you're watching the video version, this um, this textured back that really reminds me a lot of the OnePlus Open, this uh, nano, what do they call it? Nanotech vegan leather. <laughs> uh, so that's on the back. So it's got that grippy quality. I actually really like that on the on the OnePlus Open, by the way. Um, when I first got it, I was like, eh, is that tacky? But I actually really like it. So it's probably nice here too. 
5,300 milliamp hour battery, wireless 80 watt charging. That is fast for wireless. Yep. And that's what the, uh, the 14 ultra has on board. Um, the 14 pro as well, but that's not going to get a global version. It's really just a larger 14. So I'm not going to go into that one. Um, that's the phones. So before I get into the wearables, any thoughts? Uh, I, I really want to get my hands on some dang Xiaomi hardware. I have not been how able to we, review Xiaomi in a long time. And I how do we to. do that? How do we, how do we it's do a great that? question? How do yeah. we do that? <laughs> I don't know. Is it legal? I've tried in the past and not, not reach the right people. <laughs> Xiaomi, if you're listening, get in touch. There we go. Contact at androidfaithful.com. <laughs> you want to review your stuff? Let us. Um, also announced were some wearables, which I can skip to here. Um, what am I showing right now? I think this is the is this the S3? No, the S3 is interesting because where is it? God, it's one, it's one of these I can't remember. But basically, the thing about the the Xiaomi Watch S3 is that it has interchangeable bezels. So Ooh. you can swap the bezels and I don't think that I'm showing it. Is it this one? I honestly can't remember. No, this is the Xiaomi watch. That's 2. the watch too. I think the S3 is up from what we're like. Was that one? But was no, it? but the S3 is a, uh, uh, no, well, it says the, the watch S3. Yeah, down to style the Xiaomi watch S3. So is that the next one down? Yeah, that's what I, yeah, I think so. Because I know that the S3 is a circular. So, um, so maybe it's this one and that might actually be the bezel that you can change. And essentially what happens is when you swap it in, it also has a certain, um, like a wallpaper that's matched with it. Nice. So when you change the bezel, it has a new watch. Oh, it's a watch face, not a wallpaper, a new watch face that uh, swaps in once installed. So it's like you're changing the whole style of your watch just by changing the bezel. That is cool. Yeah. If you're not on the video stream, if you're audio only, the S3 that Jason has shown, it has a like a navy blue band, but then the bezel also is navy blue. So if you're yeah. super, super into making everything coordinate, presumably you could get, you know, a separate band that you can also get the matching bezel for or mix and match or however you like and not be stuck with the same color in your bezel, which actually is kind of intriguing to me. That's kind of cool. I like that. I like it, too. Cool. Um, very neat. Um, it is not Wear OS though, so keep that in mind. It's it's running Xiaomi's Hyper OS, which is based on Android, but it's not Wear OS. Uh, and they are saying 15 days of battery with the Watch S3. So apparently, this is the new norm. Um, yes, the Xiaomi Watch 2, which is uh, is that this one? Yeah, which is kind of like a kind of a mid range wearable ish sort of uh, solution, kind of comparable to you know, at least in look and maybe size to the Pixel Watch 2, Snapdragon W5 Plus Gen 1 chip running Wear OS. So this is running Wear OS. And then finally, and I don't have a picture of this one, but the Xiaomi Pad S6 Pro, which is a 12.4 inch tablet that they announced, the largest ever from Xiaomi. Look at so them with multi devices, busy phones, watches, tablets. Xiaomi's got everything. They even announced an EV, right? Didn't they announce a, a, a electric oh boy, car? I, I missed the EV. Yeah, they they announced an electric car as well. Like Xiaomi's, like everybody's you, ecosystem,ing real hard. Yeah, <laughs> everybody's AIing real really hard because there were also a whole bunch of AI features they announced in that blog post for the 14 yep. series. Yep. A lot of stuff now. Xiaomi's busy. Good for them. I mean, they're filling yeah. in that gap where Huawei was. That's what it feels like. You know, like... Um, where Huawei was? Where Huawei was. <laughs> where Huawei Every was. Every time. Every time. Yeah, <laughs> where once there was a Huawei. <laughs> <laughs> once there was a way to get back home. Excuse me. <laughs> oh, my goodness. We're, we're, we're very perfect. serious. <laughs> The perfect opportunity to segue away from yeah. singing. Away from Huawei. <laughs> <laughs> away from Huawei to Michal. What you got, Michal? And away from me to Qualcomm, because Qualcomm <laughs> took the wraps off their latest modem and their connectivity chipset. So first is the new Fast Connect 7900 chipset. This is a all-in-one connectivity chipset that bundles Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, and for the first time, ultra-wideband on a single chip. So if you aren't familiar, ultra wideband is a short range wireless communication tech that enables high precision locating. So it's commonly used for pinpointing lost items or to, uh, you know, connect to your car key and find your car in like, like a parking lot, for example. With ultra wideband integrated into the Fast Connect 7900, 
it's possible that this will accelerate the adoption of ultra wideband, which right now is only available on a select few premium Android devices. For example, in the Galaxy S24 series, only the Plus and the Ultra models have ultra wideband because they have a dedicated chip for that. Um, maybe next year, if the Galaxy S25 series bundles the Fast Connect 7900, all three devices in the S25 series, assuming it'll have three devices, of course, would have ultra wideband. Um, of course, that's not the only thing about this chip that's notable. It also supports all the other highest end connectivity features like Wi-Fi 7, Bluetooth 5.4 with Aura Cast and channel sounding. It also apparently uses AI to understand the context of how you're using your Wi-Fi connection. And I, I don't know, it feels like a little bit of buzzwordy here to say that this Wi-Fi chip is using AI. But anyways, um, another notable thing is that it's fabricated on a six nanometer node, which is a significant increase or significant um, bump forward in efficiency compared to the 14 nanometer node from its predecessor, the Fast Connect 7800. So hopefully there should be some efficiency improvements when you uh, see devices shipping with this in the second half of 2024. We'll likely see this bundled with the next gen Snapdragon 8 Gen 4 processor whenever that launches um, towards the end of this year. Um, I don't know, November, December, maybe January, who knows. And alongside that new connectivity chipset we also have the snapdragon x80 5g modem rf system this will also likely ship in the snapdragon 8 gen 4 um, later this year qualcomm says this is the first 5g modem with full support for narrowband non-terrestrial network satellite communications so this is um the basically the communication the satellite communications system that is used by a lot of low earth orbit satellites and with this integrated into the Snapdragon X80 chip, hopefully we'll see smartphones shipping with um, satellite connectivity support next year or later this year. And they don't have to have dedicated hardware for that because that's something that has been kind of holding back satellite connectivity support for so long. And uh, other than that, it also supports 6, 6x carrier aggregation, which if you're a cellular modem nerd, you'll know that it means improved cellular network performance. You... Michal, you really want satellite phones to to be a thing, don't you? I feel I feel like this has come up a couple of times. You're like you're subscribed to the satellite phone development thing because it's cool. I don't get you wrong, but like I, it's you're, a cool it's a cool it. thing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's genuinely can make a difference. You don't know if you need it. It's too late to have to go search for it, right? Like you're gonna need it. You're gonna need it then there. Yeah, that's true. It's true. That's a good point. Yeah. Someday, someday, Michelle. I, that's my Christmas wish for you. That's my holiday wish for you is that we get satellite phones this year. So, <laughs> all right, cool. Well, that was a lot, but that's not it because Mobile World Congress has been happening this whole past week in Barcelona. The Hamon. I'm very, very jealous of friends of the show, Miriam and Michael Fisher and Josh Vergara. I'm, I'm seeing them all on socials parading around um Barcelona. flaunting their hamon yeah, <laughs> but and, and, but like also they're they are hands on with these phones and I'm super I'm I'm super jealous so I hope they all had a good time but uh I'm going to I'm going to blow through a bunch of stuff that also came out at Mobile World Congress that I think we you know we just want to touch upon um so last week we talked about ZTE remember when we were mm -hmm. talking about that Japanese that flip phone that was really interesting mm -hmm. so ZTE showed up to Mobile World Congress in a big big way uh they had ZTE's Nubia Flip 5G which is similar to the one that we saw the Japan model last week uh, with the circular front uh, front display. It's a budget-friendly foldable with dual screens, high-resolution cameras, price, priced at $599 for global markets. Uh, the Nubia 760 Ultra, which is starting from $599, puts in the Snapdragon 8 Gen 3 and unique features like an under-display selfie camera. There you go, Wynn. Mm -hmm. um, and then my favorite thing was that ZTE got wacky. And if you're watching the uh, the video, you can see what we're talking about here. Uh, they got wacky with some very specific type phones like the uh, Nubia Music Phone, uh, which has a really cool Roy Lichtenstein-style design with a speaker that looks like a record on the yeah, back. Yeah, throw those like, vinyl heads out there, man. Yeah, if you're listening to the audio version of this podcast, go look up the ZTE Nubia music phone just to see what this phone looks like. That got my attention. I was like, it's, whoa, what is this? Yeah, it's really um, attractive. And then they've also got the Nubia Neo 2 5G gaming phone, uh, taking a page out of uh, Asus and the ROG phones, um, a, a gaming-specific phone. Um, so ZTE showing up pretty, pretty strong. Important to note that the uh, that the uh, the gaming phone and the music phone all start at one hundred and fifty dollars. 
Um, wow. So I'm actually, I'm actually really interested in that music phone. We'll I, I think I'm going to try to get my hands on the Dubia Flip because I, it does seem to be like a U.S. launch. So I will get my hands on that and then just not worry about looking for one in Japan. Cool. There you go. Um, a lot of folks are talking about what Honor showed up with with the Honor Magic 6 Pro. We talked about this a little bit last week with the Porsche design. Um, but I got to admit, Ooh. I like the I like the look of this phone, like the 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 back of the phone with the camera, uh, the camera bump kind of uh, looking, you know, looks very unique. That looks like unlike any other kind of phone. Um, I was very impressed by this. Um, but of course, uh, a big part of their announcement was the AI features. Uh, they, <laughs> they shared information about the eventual release of an AI powered eye tracking feature that knows when you're looking at the magic capsule, uh, also known as the dynamic island uh, that we talked about, <laughs> and will automatically open the app of the notification. So Wait the minute, idea what? being- No, no, don't do that when I look at something. So, <laughs> so my, like, question, my question is how long do you have to look at it for yeah. it to trigger, right? Like, Great yeah. question, Ron. Yeah. Yeah. That would be really annoying if everything you looked at just launched the app. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I have to imagine there's some sort of beat, you know, like, but, oh, look, looking at it for a second, okay. They've, they've also got something called, quote unquote, magic portal, which automatically recognizes addresses or events and messages and links to the appropriate app or map, which is actually pretty cool and something I would think Google would do, um, which Google does throughout their kind of suite of apps, but having it be on the phone level is really interesting. Um, it's running the Qualcomm Snapdragon HN3 with a 5,600 milliamp battery. That's the other undersold, you know, like the, 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 the secret agenda of this phone. It is a huge battery. It's got that 80, 80 watt charging over a cable or 66 watt wirelessly. Um, and it's six, 6.8 inches with 120 Hertz OLED display with up to 5,000 nits. So the honor magic six pro showed up very with a strong showing of mobile world Congress. Um, I don't know, Michelle, what do you think of this phone? Very solid hardware. And it's basically like Honor is basically, I mean, of course, they were a spinoff of Huawei originally. You know, we all know that, right? So, but Huawei's always made amazing hardware. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, today, you can't get their devices with Google Apps on their yeah. software. But basically, if you buy an Honor phone, you get that amazing Huawei hardware that we all love and miss, but with access to Google Apps. So, I think yeah. that's a win win. Like, if you miss Huawei hardware, go take a look at Honor. And you get a 5,600 milliamp battery, which is just, which yeah. will never, will never end. Um, that's not all. Um, you might remember a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about HMD as they uh, announced that they were going to be not renewing their Nokia license. They're the people who make uh, the Android phones with the Nokia branding on them currently. They're going to they're gonna go out on their own and do their own phones. So at Mobile World Congress, they gave us a glimpse of what that looks like. Um, and it, it, it the first like one Barbie. is, a, is it's Barbie. <laughs> um, they are teaming up with Mattel to make a Barbie flip phone. Um, that's going to be coming out this summer. Why this didn't come out last year with the movie, eh, whatever, who knows, but, um, this phone right yeah, here, the idea is to make the pink that's Barbie flip phone. flip phone, um, which is, you know, a little bit of a, you know, whatever, that's a gimmick. But what yeah. got my attention, uh, was the fact that buried in the Barbie conversation was also that, uh, in addition to the Barbie phones, they're going to be developing a modular based phone platform, um, that will uh, innate, will basically have pogo pins and enable the ability to have specialized hardware attached to these modular phones. So, you know, you've got a display, you've got a camera system, you've got a battery, then you've got the pogo pins and like for medical devices or like other industries where they have specialized needs with phones, they'll build this platform out. We don't know what it will look like because they didn't have it at Mobile World Congress. And in fact, Michelle and I were talking about it earlier today. All they had in their booth was uh, shots of blurry phones. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> you could promise even, it's something you could. Yeah, exactly. Um, so HMD building an air of mystery around what's to come from them, right? Maybe so. we should have held on to Nokia just a little bit longer. So we had yeah. something to show. Oh, these phones are so hot. We had to censor them, but <laughs> modular phone. You had me a modular. I'm listening yeah. to HMD. I want to know okay. more contact at Android faithful.com. Get in touch. Let us know. Is Barbie um, a last year thing or an also this year? It's a last thing, year thing. I guess. It's yeah. A, it's, yeah. So this it, is like so, it feels a little bit laggy or yeah. this is, a little this late, is a little late. reactionary. Yeah, yeah. yeah, a little bit, a little bit. Yeah. It's okay. It's and okay. then last last bit here on Mobile World Congress, Motorola, Lenovo, and Motorola were there mm -hmm. um, with people at Mobile World Congress, hands on with 
the rollable concept phone. We saw this last year, the fabric like back that could roll. And we saw people uh, slapping on their wrists like a wrist bracelet. Well, it was there at the show. People, I saw Michael Fisher holding it in, on, <clears throat> on Instagram. Um, here we're, we're looking at a, a GIF on TechCrunch of someone putting it on their wrist. Um, it exists. It is real. I love it. Um, there's no guarantee it'll become a product. Um, and actually, you know, now that we got to see people holding it, it looks more bendable than rollable. It's more of a bendy yeah. phone. Um, and it's, it's like got a, a caterpillar sp- kind of, yeah. And it's got a squishy <laughs> quality looking to it, but I like the fact that it looks to be like fabric and mm-hmm. yeah. I, I love, I want this phone. I want this phone just because it's just ridiculous. Yeah. So. It hits, it hits like you were, you already said this before Lana. it hits that power glove, like Pip yeah. boy from fallout kind of feel. And I, I don't know, want to try it. And yep. if you end up someplace and you don't have a pillow and you got to fall asleep, just <laughs> flip it over and lay your head right there. And it looks pretty cozy. I mean, it looks yeah. pretty comfortable. That's, that's a call yeah. with, that, that could not be IP anything, right? With that fabric back. Oh, geez. That's a good yeah. question. No, yeah. And so. also, um, uh, they show <laughs> they show it using itself as a stand. Like, it basically is bent so that the bottom third of it is resting on the table. Yep. Sorry, I, I don't want to poke holes in this, but that's kind of scratch, y'all. But I, I do think that conceptually it's really great. It's just um, well, that that's the question of, of what that do. rollable display on the fl- on the front Fair. side, where the display, yeah. how prone is it to scratching or not? What you know, all so many questions about this. But I, I mean, it, but I do love it. it. Looks like a it looks like a sweatband. Yeah, I was gonna say it kind of looks dirty too. Like yeah. you throw, <laughs> well, think of all the people throwing that on your wrist, your wrist yeah. all the time, time and time oh. again. It's just collecting all that the dirt in there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. how do you wash that? Like, uh, oh yeah, when it gets all, <laughs> when cycle, it gets delicate bag. When he, if you wear it and you sweat into it and like all that sort of, <laughs> yeah, oh, don't wear it to the gym. Oh, Bad yeah. idea. Yeah. Ooh, I love this phone so much. So. <laughs> anyway, so that, that's all the hardware that was at Mobile World Congress. It was a packed year. I think this is probably the busiest Mobile World Congress we've seen in a, in a, in, a, in recent years. Um, just so much stuff coming out of it. So uh, can I can I throw an audible in there? One sure. last thing that didn't yeah. make it, but I just saw the headline on the verge, and I have to add it. Yeah, uh, a twenty-eight thousand milliamp hour battery <laughs> phone. Whoa! There you go. Inner Telecom's Energizer Hard Case P28K. That's not a phone. That's a battery with with a phone. That's like not, not a phone with a battery. It's a battery it's a with battery. Like a battery it's pack a battery with a phone in it. Is, is phone in it? Yeah. Says. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I don't know if that's it or yeah. Anyways, so talk about a chonker. This episode's full of chonkers. This is a chonker. <laughs> Anyways, oh, there gosh. you go. Uh, uh, well, um, on on that note, um, <laughs> probably the latest that we've ever had in the show. It is now time for the patron pick. Uh, so every week on Monday at around twelve o'clock Eastern, we post three stories for our lovely patrons to vote upon, and then we discuss the one that you decided amongst you patrons. And we have a new thing coming on uh, where we we have a new thing where we have you know our lovingly AI generated images to you know kind of like. A decorate a, 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 to, as an accoutrement. To, I love that word. Use it too much. Uh, we have our lovely AI generated uh, patron uh, image for the week. And this week's was from Devor. Do, oh, I'm so sorry, Devor. Devor. Do, you just say Devor D. That's fine. Devor D. Devor yeah. D has actually a very, very good uh, AI generated. Uh, yeah. Google, like the kind of like the old school uh, Google Android bot reading a Google newspaper. Gosh, darn, it looks good, dude. That's that's pretty. We got, we got so many of these in in the past couple of weeks, by the way. Keep them coming. Email contact at Android Faithful. We're going to use them every week on the patron picks. So we're going to see you have you all get involved. We got some awesome ones. Um, but this one feels extra special given this week's yeah. <laughs> patron I, pick. <laughs> Devor, you, you AI prompted the heck out of this thing. It's, it looks amazing. But so let's talk about what what we voted on and what what, what didn't win and did win so uh number one loser third place is uh, about the vivo x fold 3 controlling mac os mac os only 22 percent of our patrons wanted that only 36 percent of our patrons wanted us to talk about android tv introducing a new quick access row on your home screen and the winner this week i'm and, and i'm not sad about it is androidify strikes back google now lets you create a custom android bot so Way, 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 way back. There was a site that allowed you to build your own, you know, uh, Android, you know, out of like various different like colors and like, you know, clothing and everything. And you could like output it. Uh, I definitely had one. And I think they took that page down in 2020. And so we've been been lacking a little avatar, an Android avatar maker. Well, 
now that they have a new, you know, 3D, slightly chonky, but still quite cute, uh, the bot uh, to replace the old Android, they now have a return to Androidify with a new site on Android.com where you can create your own bot, where you, you can create your own version of the bot. They have like 20 something different materials, which is like basically the color, although some of them are like fishbowl, fishbowl looking uh or kind of transparent they have like clothing they have accessories you can put on and yeah create your own bot and you can either download it directly to your computer as an image or it'll also generate a qr code for you to download it that way so yeah and i don't say it's not quite androidifying because it's a little bit limited so you can't like you know make your own personal representation of yourself yeah. as an android you but it's it tall and skinny you can't yeah, yeah. no yeah. no but you can you can certainly make a cute little bot for yourself. Uh, I did. Long time listeners might remember that Jason and I and Eileen Rivera used the Androidify. We made our own little Android guys, and that was the artwork for all about Android for years, right? Jason, yeah. for like five, five, six years, our little Android bots, right? So That's right. Um, this is probably a good time to thank Michelle for giving me the heads up that Google was selling little Android bots in the Google store. And I got mine the other day. Um, so they, they're they're leaning into bug droid, right? Like it's yeah. a it's a thing. So I made yeah. sure to notify you guys first that privately yeah. because I knew it'd sell out like the moment I yep. tweeted yeah, about Michelle it. Yeah, Michelle was great. He told us like how many were left, and so <laughs> I also bought one. Mine's not here yet, but I got I, I yeah. got mine in like two days. It was That's crazy. Incredible. I did. Yeah, I heard um, a bunch of other stuff, so that probably that probably they're all sold out now on the Google Merch store. But if you're listening and you want to buy one of your own. Um, these are actually made by Andrew Bella Dead Zebra, and he's going to be selling it on his website, I think shop.deadzebra.com, mm -hmm. in the yeah. middle of March. So just keep yeah. an eye out for that. Yeah, my kids have not discovered this yet, so it's just a matter of time. <laughs> yes, they're, they're way yeah. better than used to be. the The antenna are actually movable, like yeah. the old Android figurines. The ears would just snap off. Constantly. I did notice that. Yeah, you can yeah. you can change it. Yeah, these are great. The build they're, quality they're is awesome. awesome. Yeah, Amazing. So, very so. cool. Um, but yeah, that is our patron pick for the week. Uh, and if you would like to be part of like the fun of picking and oh, and you know, uh, oh, sorry. So yeah, I did do a bot my own little Android if I me I tried to try to somehow make queen code bot. Somehow. Th this is great. And Jason, Michelle, me, we need to all make our own and we're going to make some artwork with this. Like, let's make our own little bots. Oh, and, uh, yeah, we should do it. There yeah. was a crown. Right. So yeah. I deleted leaned in. Of course, there's a hoodie. I own like 50,000 black hoodies. That's just my my developer wear. So yeah, actually, if you if you all use Androidify, you know, send them in, like share share, share with us your favorite Androidified bots uh, of the Android Faithful. Uh, email us at contact.androidfaithful.com. And yeah, send us your droid, send us your bots. I can't call them droids anymore. I want to say droid, they're bots. <laughs> send us your bots. Nice. Um, but yes, in particular, we want to shout out our, just a few of our lovely patrons this week. Um, to uh sorry uh thumb vu uh tim davies michael griffith from virginia thank you so much for being patrons and for supporting us and making the show possible we could not we literally could not do this without you so thank you very much yep. thank, thank you, you indeed and yeah uh, so programming note uh, yeah. No emails this week because we ran so long, but there was some news that had nothing to do with <laughs> with Mobile World Congress, right? <laughs> yeah. So, and Michelle and was a pretty big one, right? First bit of news is uh, if you're a Samsung you know, device owner, which is probably a good number of you because of the number one Android OEM, um, you'll be happy to hear that Samsung has announced when they'll roll out the One UI 6.01 update to their existing devices, including the Galaxy S23 series, including the S23 FE, the Z Fold 5, the Z Flip 5, and the Tab S9 series. They'll be rolling this out at the end of March, and it'll include several of the Galaxy AI features that Samsung unveiled with the S24 at Galaxy Unpacked. And these features include Chat Assist, Live Translate, Interpreter, Circle of Search with Google, Note Assist, Browsing Assist, Transcript Assist, Generative Edit, Edit Suggestions, Instant Slow Mo, and AI Wallpapers. They're all including a whole bunch of features that they um, unveiled first with the Galaxy S24 series. So it's quite awesome to see them bring these features um, to their existing devices. And if you're not familiar, these features rely on a mix of Google's Gemini Nano or Pro large language models, depending on whether or not they run offline or in the cloud. And they do things like provide translations and voice calls, conversations and meetings, um, summarize notes and web pages, transcribe meetings, and the gallery-based features that I showed off on episode 28 of the Android Faithful podcast um, lets you do things like expand photos or create brand new ones entirely on device. Um, there is one caveat. 
All these features are coming to the devices that I mentioned, except for instant slow-mo that won't be coming to the S23 FE, but it will be coming to all the other Galaxy devices that are mentioned in the blog post. So uh, keep an eye out for the update on your S23 device, your Z Fold 5, Z Flip 5, or Tab S9 device. Sometime at the end of March, this will be rolling out um, over the air. Google, so Google on its Pixel devices has the kind of dedicated, you know, uh, AI chip, uh, or you know, or so they they pegged it as kind of like an AI chip uh, on the Pixel devices that helps it do all these things. Does Samsung have that on some of their phones? Because it's interesting that they're kind of pushing this to all the devices. Maybe they've had these these like specialized chips for years, or maybe they're just not that necessary for these particular well, things. Yeah, I mean, at least the Snapdragon devices, they have their own Snapdragon NPU. Yeah. You know, like okay. Snap Qualcomm has their own AI processing hub. They have all their, their AI SDKs and everything. Like they have all mm -hmm. their own stuff. Yeah. And I'm sure I'm assuming Samsung's Exynos chips that are sold that are used in their European devices and a lot of their Asian market devices also has their NPU and their various AI blocks and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Cool. Um, That's before we move on, quick question from the live folks watching live in our chat. Uh, by the way, we live stream every Tuesday, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific on YouTube at youtube.com slash daily tech news show and twitch.tv slash good day internet. And Marcello uh, had a question saying, is the Samsung S24 worth getting? It's a want, not a need. I'm wondering what the Android faithful family has to say, say about that. I have not touched the Samsung S24 yet, but I know Michelle, you have had to spend some time with it. Uh, Jason's got it there. I got the ultra. Yeah. What do you, what do you think? Is it, is it, is it, is it worth getting or? I would say of the three devices in the lineup, my personal pick would be S24 Plus if I were to buy a device because um, the S24 Ultra, I think, requires too, bit, too big of a premium to justify getting it. Like the only real benefits it have over the Plus model, I think, is the fact that it has the S Pen, a 5X telephoto camera, and the oh. Gorilla Glass armor. Yeah, 5X uh, I telephoto. Think those, that's, those are, I love, I love, they're, I love they're it. nice, but I don't think... I think the S24 Plus has everything else that you need for the average person. That's like that's like the the peak. I will of... admit, I I feel like every time a Samsung phone comes out, or every time an iPhone comes out, you get all the articles comparing or stuff like that. Oh, but yeah. I feel mm -hmm. like I've seen more articles raving about the camera system in the S24 than I have in it, for the S23 or previous releases. Like it sounds like the camera on this phone is the real deal. Like it's it's really top notch. So there are still, agree. yeah. Mm -hmm. It, it's still it's really good as usual like there are still some things i think i wish samsung would fix like the um the the shutter speed like it's, it's like a long on, long standing problem where you take a photo and like there might be some parts that are blurry but other than that like i haven't had any problems with it like it's taking great photos for me i have the s24 ultra by the way not the plus i'm mm -hmm. just saying like i would if i were to buy a phone from that series it would probably be the plus just for the the features and value you get for what is price. the price difference between the Plus and the Ultra? I'm just curious. I think it's like three hundred dollars, or is it four hundred dollars difference? It's a pretty substantial gap. Yeah, um, eleven nineteen, one thousand one hundred twenty, according to well, that's the T-Mobile site. Um, yeah, okay, one thousand looks like one starting one thousand, and then you got the Ultra. I think that's like you know another two hundred fifty or three hundred more than that. So, so yeah, you're paying a lot for a couple of features. But I love a good telephoto lens. It's really hard for me to not have one if if you have the option. Yeah. Right. Meanwhile, at the same time, like I'm not I'm not a huge user of the S Pen, so that's a feature that I would be paying for that I would not use very often. So yeah, Gotta unless unless it, it, unless you become a user of the S Pen. Well, like, yeah, yeah, unless I like <laughs> force myself to use it enough that I started yeah. to really rely upon it and everything, but. Yeah. I, you know, at, was it Steve Jobs that said the best, you know, the best writing or pointing thing is your finger? I mean, it, it's not like that's a, that's a, you know, that isn't a totally obvious point, yeah. but it's always the thing that I have right with me that I don't need to pull out another thing in order to do it. So yeah. I just don't. Anyways, um, I am working on a review of the S24 Ultra. I will be having one uh, in the coming weeks because I do like the phone a heck of a lot, but I always like their Ultras. Their Ultras are just... Man, they're they're just so powerful. They do they do so much. Are, are they justified? But is the price justified though? And that's really a personal uh, preference. Um, but real quick, uh, one last story before we round things out. Uh, Google Pay, the Google Pay app. 
it turns out well we knew that it you know that <laughs> we knew that things were not long in this world for the google pay but june 4th 2024 that is the day that it dies for good google wallet will be your go-to there we go i mean not a surprise sad and i can't even say that google pay hasn't been killed before because like at this point <laughs> i've lost track of all the different permutations of of google's uh payments um you know portfolio it's the it's the it's the carousel that keeps turning the merry-go-round of wallet pay uh, all variations android on wallet those, android pay words. google pay google, yeah. exactly. G -Pay. Wallet, pay, google <laughs> android those four things interchangeably you yep. know thrown in together soon we'll, we'll start stacking them and google's android pay or android's wallet pay you know it'll happen so frustrating so frustrating google so anyways it's getting simpler right <laughs> google pay is going away so that's a good thing right i mean yeah it is getting simpler but it's almost to the point now where it's like the joke isn't even worth the effort anymore yeah. like, <laughs> it's just like it's like oh come on it's just right? a little but, too obvious at this right. point but you know but hey I, google wallet I'm, I'm i'm pro google wallet i love my google wallet if it doesn't my, my whole thing about google wallet is the frustration i have too many phones on my desk the frustration I have with actually getting to my cards, right? Like, and and part of that was because I was using GPay, and then you've got to click on, you've got to tap on your little icon, and then and then choose your cards. I then discovered that there was a shortcut link to Google Wallet that goes right to all my all my cards. So I was like, oh, that made my life a lot easier. Like my main frustration about GPay was GPay's existence period and the obstacle it was to get to Google Wallet. So get yeah. rid of it, go to Google Wallet, that's fine. So yeah. yeah. There you go. Well you won't have to wait much longer this uh, summer, which as you know, you're gonna blink and it's gonna be here. So yeah. Until there Google Wallet go. gets killed. For, mm -hmm. for Android Wallet or Android Pay. <laughs> Wasn't Android Pay already a thing? There's know. still time for them to rename more things. So yeah. who the heck knows? <laughs> well, hey, you know, Gmail's dying, right? Did you see Did you see our friend of the show at Killed by Google was uh, oh. in, the, in the middle of that whole Gmail uh, ruckus yes. that happened? <laughs> That's right. Which was, which was uh, yeah, not true, by the way, just so everyone yeah, knows. Gmail's not going anywhere. It's not going so. anywhere. Oh, anyway. God. Too funny. What a show, everybody. What a show. What Mobile a Mobile World, World Congress. Congress. It feels like we were there, doesn't it? It does. <laughs> I'm full. I ate so much ham on this entire hour and a half that we were doing the show, and you had no idea. Uh, <laughs> we reached the end of this episode of Android Faithful. Love doing this show with you all. And we are so blessed to have the folks at Google um, giving us amazing people to talk to, like Bjorn Kilburn. Thank you, Bjorn, for uh, coming on to the show today and telling us all about the state of Android Wear um, as it is right now. So thank you, Bjorn. Thank you, Google. Ron, what you got? Yes. Yeah, so uh, go follow me on social. I'm at RonXO, but I actually don't want to plug anything I'm working on. I want to have a follow-up note from last week's feedback. Um, uh, we had an email last week uh, from Tom from Ireland who shared the NearDrop application, which uh, gives nearby share functionality on OS X, uh, on Mac OS. Um, after the show last week, I installed it. And dude, this thing works like a charm. Like it was like, it was the kind like, if you had those moments where like with technology where you do something and then you got to put the device down cause you're freaked out. Like it, <laughs> it, worked, it worked so well that now I am not going to be you on um, my previous solution of uploading a file to Slack and then going on the Slack app and downloading it on my phone to get it. I am now going to use NearDrop. Uh, so if you are a Mac OS wow. user and you have an Android phone, go to github.com slash G-R-I-S-K-A -A -S -S -A, uh, or just Google NearDrop. Uh, you can find it on GitHub. Um, but it worked awesome. So, you know, big, big, big uh, personal, uh, uh, what's the word, recommendation uh, for NearDrop. I was impressed. Yeah, so that's github.com slash G R I S H K A slash Grishka ne yeah. near drop. Yep. But near and N and D are capitalized. Yeah, it's probably just better to search and for. If you, and if you go to Reddit and Google and go to go to the Android subreddit and, and yeah. search for near drop, you'll find you'll find Grishka posting about it there. But but testimonial, I did it, it works, it's running on my machine right now. I'm doing it all the time. It's awesome. So nice. nice. Right on. Excellent. Near oh, drop. Nice. Thank you, Ron. Uh, Michelle, what do you want to plug? 
I'll plug all my socials, Twix, Mastodon, Threads, Reddit, Discord, etc., etc., at Michelle Rahman. And you should follow me there because I actually talked about Near Drop all the way back in August of last year. And again, yeah, Ron. Yeah, you hear about this stuff months, uh, many months ago if you follow me on socials. Um, but if you want to support the work that I do, you can go to patreon.com slash Michelle Rahman. And uh, I'll be posting a lot about Android 15 in the coming weeks. I already have a lot queued up. I did post something big today that I didn't get to talk about just because the show would have ran even longer than it already has. So if you want to hear about what's new in Android and what's coming in the future release, you can follow me on all those socials and support me on Patreon. Do it. Michelle's work is awesome. We are thrilled to be here with you, Michelle, each and every week. We're we're blessed. Um, Wynn, what about you? Uh, yeah, I'm an Android dev. That's my day job. And you can find uh, technical talks that I do about Android development at my website, randomlytyping.com and associated videos and code. And on the socials, I'm really just on Instagram, where, by the way, I post a lot of, you know, a needless uh, workout videos. But usually that requires me uploading to Dropbox and downloading. So actually, after the show, I'm going to download near drop and see how that works. I'm oh, actually really out. excited. I'm really excited. So yeah, follow me at queen co monkey. I am on Instagram. I'll try to be better about like threads and Mastodon. Cause I do want to give the Fediverse some love, but I mean, if you really can't find me, it is Instagram. I'm sorry. Y'all uh, not cool enough for TikTok. Um, uh, but that, that's it. Uh, I'm glad to be here with you guys. Went with loud. Not cool enough for TikTok. <laughs> no, it's true. It's really true. my handle, honestly. Neither am I. <laughs> Try as I might, it just doesn't work for me. Oh, boy. Um, well, thank you, Wynn. Um, As for me, go plug in yellowgoldstudios.com into your web browser. It'll take you to uh, the YouTube channel that I am currently trying to build up. Um, did a review last week of the OnePlus Open. This week, I'm working on a comparison of the OnePlus Watch 2 to the OnePlus Watch 1 to see if they've made some of the right decisions around improving the watch hardware from the last time. And it's all going to be here. I'm like super close to a thousand subscribers. I'm super excited about that. Like I'm like 11 away. So you know what? Go there, make it I'm happen. It. <laughs> Jason's review was amazing, y'all. You need to see it. Like yeah. seriously, oh, jaw dropping. So good. So, so, so good. good. Oh, thank it's, you. It was fun. great. It's, it's also Insane a lot of work. Insane production value. Yeah. And yeah. amazing, right y'all. Thank you. I appreciate that. Very impressed. Um, and that is it for this week's episode of Android Faithful. We do the show every Tuesday. You can subscribe by going to androidfaithful.com. Send us emails, contact at androidfaithful.com. And we might actually have a, a feedback section next week. We probably will. We just had a lot of stuff to talk about this week. So don't worry about it. You're, you're going to come back into the episode next time. Uh, do subscribe to us in any of the podcatchers that you, uh, that you love and adore. Pocket Cast, Spotify, Apple, wherever you have to listen to your podcast and yes like we've said many times before you can support us directly by going to patreon.com slash android faithful that does give you special perks like bonus content and uh, the ability to vote for stories and have your name read on the show lots of fun stuff we could not do this show without you all so thank you for being here with us each and every week we love you and we'll see you next time on android faithful bye everybody bye